All right, so here we go with the chapter eight lecture for Geography 101 regarding climate change. Um, first, let me be clear. The climate of the Earth is a dynamic and ever-changing system. It's complex. One, our, our handle on it is not as good as it could be, especially in how it behaves and how it responds. Um, at, at best, it's a loose handle. Otherwise, we'd be able to perfectly predict everything that's going to happen within the climate, which includes the short-term climate or weather. Now, during the 20th century, human population has exploded. We've gone from 1.6 billion in about 1900 to about 6.1 in the year 2000, and we're closing in, if we haven't already, past 7 billion people. This means that we are existing on the earth in such large numbers that we are going to have some degree of an impact to the system of the earth itself. Um, one of the things that we have seen is that most of this in explosion in population has been in what we call quote unquote developing countries um, or third world countries basically where as technology and science and medicine work their way into these areas their standard of livings begin to increase and their life expectancies increase at the same time carbon dioxide emissions from human activity have increased by about tenfold now what do we know about past climates? Um, past climates we studied through a science called paleoclimatology. We use all sorts of things to try to figure out what these past climates were. This isn't going to include fossils from the fossil record, um, rocks themselves, certain rocks record certain climatic conditions. If you know how to read the rocks, you can read those climatic conditions. And then we also use a bunch of what we call climate proxies. These are going to be things like air bubbles or gas pockets in ice, in the glaciers or ice sheets, dust in the ice, tree rings, um, coral, ex fa uh, other seashells, all sorts of things. And we use these to try to, def to decipher what the past climate conditions were. Um, now, in the short term, for say the last couple of thousand years, gas in the ice is going to be very helpful because it will give us actually what the chemistry of the atmosphere was when that air was trapped. Dust in the ice is very interesting in that it appears to be related directly to the number and severity of storms that occur worldwide, um, which is a very interesting way of looking at what sort of weather patterns the world is having. And then we can also use tree rings, which basically give us a really good handle on when there were or when there were not favorable conditions for the growth of trees in that area. Now, in terms of long-term analysis of climate systems or the climate history, we look at isotopes. Uh, remember, an isotope is a type of atom of a specific element that just happens to have a different number of neutrons in it. So it's the same number of protons, same number of electrons, different number of neutrons, and that's what makes an isotope. Um, in isotope studies, one of our favorites to use for climate is oxygen-16 versus oxygen-18. Um, basically, oxygen-18, because it has two more neutrons in it, is a little heavier. And so the way it behaves in the climate system varies depending on what we're looking at. So, for example, if we look at the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16, and we see that that ratio is higher, that usually indicates that ocean temperatures were colder. If the oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 ratio was lower, it tends to indicate that the oceans were hotter. And this has to do with how the water is evaporating and what's being contained within um, the, the, uh, within the materials that are being laid down. We usually do these measurements on ocean sediments and uh, fossil shells or even just seashells 
especially for uh, sub sub visual organisms that don't really want to say microscopic because sometimes they aren't really microscopic but called foraminifera now if we look at ice on the other hand or snowfall the oxygen 16 oxygen 18 ratios reverse their meaning so that if we see oxygen 18 versus oxygen 16 higher that means a warmer climate and oxygen 16 18 lower means a colder climate um, the trend over the last 50 million years has been towards a colder climate based on the oxygen isotope studies other short term more shorter term reconstructions include carbon isotopes um, specifically carbon 12 versus carbon 13 we do use carbon 14 which you may have heard of a lot uh, and carbon-14 is basically an unstable isotope of carbon that radioactively decays back into nitrogen over about a 5,278 year period, which means that we can use carbon-14 and the amount of carbon-14 in any organic matter to look at how old something is back to about 50,000 years or so. Now, carbon-13 versus carbon-12 is very similar to oxygen isotope analysis. Uh, but what it tells us more interestingly is the type of photosynthesis that is being done which will then control what the carbon ratios are um, other places we can look for for um, information are going to include lake sediment cores where we can use carbon isotopes tree rings we can use carbon isotopes in as well as dend the idea of dendrochronology which is basically you use tree rings to figure out how old something is, but then you can use dendroclimatology, which is you're using the tree rings as a proxy for climate itself. Um, we also can use spilithiums, which are basically cave formations. Now, cave formations are like stalactites, stalagmites, columns, soda straws, cave popcorn, etc. Um, we have to be a little careful in this because they usually are made of or always are made of calcite but the calcite may have come from the rock that's above it the limestone that's above it so we kind of have to be careful because there may be some cross contamination between the atmosphere because all cave formations actually grow in the air and the material that's coming out of the rocks in solution above and then also we can use the skeletons of corals um, for their calcite, which we can get to the oxygen isotopes from. Now, also known, looking at the short-term history of the Earth's climate from what we know, we know that the Pleistocene epoch, um, which is the most recent period of glaciation, began about 2.5 million years ago. And during the last period of glaciation during that epoch, uh, it lasted between 110,000 to about 11,700 years ago, with the actual maximum for ice advance being about 20,000 years ago. Now, looking at this, what we see is that about 14,000 years ago, temperatures spiked for a couple of thousand years, and then they dropped again. Uh, this is sometimes called the Younger Dryas Cold Period. Um, there are some interesting things with that in North American history, uh, especially among some of the uh, Paleo-Indians of North America seeming to have disappeared from parts of North America due to this uh, cold snap. And then about seven or 11,700 years ago, there was an abrupt warming which marked the end of the Pleistocene. Now, coming forward in time into what is contemporarily referred to as our written history, um, between 800 AD and 1200 AD there was a period of very mild climate which is sometimes referred to as the medieval climate anom anomaly it was unusually warm in fact it was so unusually warm it may have actually been as warm or even warmer than it is today um, but then starting about 1250 AD and lasting till about 1850 AD global temperatures suddenly dropped. This is sometimes referred to as the Little Ice Age. Um, glaciers advanced worldwide, and it played a role in the spread of disease, especially in Asia and Europe. 
which ended up actually changing culture in Europe because you had the plagues basically devastating populations, making it in, almost impossible for the previous feudal systems of uh, government and life to actually be able to continue. Now, temps fluctuated strongly during this period. It wasn't constantly always cold, uh, um, but it fluctuated, it fluctuated strongly. And the fact there is actually one year that's recorded as the year without a, a summer, where they recovered snowfall in, or recorded snowfall in London during June and July. So very cold temperatures for at least one year, but they were fluctuating back and forth. Um, we think that this is probably related to the fact that there were a number of significant volcanic eruptions that took place during this 600 year window, as well as interactions between the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Arctic Oscillation. Now, what are the mechanisms for natural climate change? As I said at the beginning, the Earth is a dynamic system and the climate is always changing. A quick study of the geologic record tells us that. The, there's no doubt that the climate changes. Um, one of the things that is playing a role in the variance of climate over time is what we call solar variability, i.e. this is a change in the output of the sun's power, or the sun's radiance or irradiance. Um, this changes over various different time cycles. So if we take a look at the big picture, billions of years, what we see is that since the sun formed, it's actually gotten about one third brighter than, than when it originally formed. So it's one third brighter today than it was 4.5 billion years ago. That's a significant increase. You know, if you basically have increased the brightness by a th factor of one third, it's a lot more radiation that can reach the Earth. Now, when we look at it over terms of thousands of years, this is when we start looking at the magnetic field fluctuations in the sun. Um, the sun is a very interesting body from a physical standpoint in that it rotates so fast, it twists and bends its magnetic field into these tight loops and whatnot. Um, on the short term scale, they can explode, causing solar flares, which can cause other impacts to us. And then over the decades, there are what we call sunspots. These are areas that look dark on the sun, but if you were to bring them to the earth and isolate them by themselves, they're still brighter than anything that we can produce on the earth. Um, now, interestingly enough, between 1645 and 17. 15, there was a very long period of inactivity on the sun when it comes to sunspots. And this also happens to coincide with part of the coldest period of the Little Ice Age. But this is some, somewhat discounted by some people because during the period of 2005 to 2010, we had a similar minimum in sunspot activity, but we didn't see that much of an effect on temperatures. Now, this is not to say that sunspot activity does not have an effect on temperatures. It may simply be the fact that instead of being a 70-year period, we're looking at a five-year period, so that the impact was not as great, obviously, because, well, we're talking about one fourteenth of the time. So, We'll leave it at that. Now, the Earth's orbit also changes dynamically. Uh, this is something called the Milanchevic cycles, named after uh, a Serbian astronomer named Milankovic. Uh, basically, he looked at variances in astrological record, astronomical records, as well as what he was observing, and he noted three different changes that happen over time. The first is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So if we think of the orbit of the Earth going around the Sun, the eccentricity is the measure of how circular or elliptical that um, orbit is. And what we know is that apparently the orbit changes from circular to elliptical and back again over the course of about 100,000 years. And this has to do with gravitational interaction between the Earth and the other planets as everything's orbiting. Then there's also the axial wobble. The Earth's axis wobbles much like a slowing top. So if you think of a top, when it slows, it starts, it 
its top starts spinning like this, the Earth's axis does something similar. Um, and it does this what we call perce precession, where the north pole of the ax of the Earth changes the point where it's pointing in the sky, and it does this rotation once every 26,000 years. And then the axis of the Earth itself changes how far it's tilted. Right now, the Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, but it appears to vary between 21 and a half to 24 and a half degrees. This is in part due to the fact that we have a large moon. The moon helps keep the Earth's orbit relatively stable in terms of the axial tilt. Other planets actually have evidence of them tilting much more. In fact, uh, Uranus right now is on a 90 degree tilt. So that those can play a role. Then we can also look at the position of the continents as well as the topography. As we'll talk about in the upcoming chapters on the solid Earth, the continents move. Now, they don't move quickly, but they do move. So they change position over time through a process called plate tectonics. Not only do the continents move, but island chains can appear and disappear due to volcanism. And both of these can change the way ocean currents are flowing. In addition, mountain ranges can rise and fall as a function of plate tectonics. Th all of this can change not only ocean currents, but now when you start building mountains, you can change atmospheric currents. In fact, the Himalaya mountains are so tall, they actually cause the jet stream to be pushed more northerly than it would be if the Himalayas were not there. So that has a dramatic effect on the weather in North America. In addition to this, um, the position of continents and mountains can affect rainfall patterns, which can affect vegetation patterns, which can affect um, the amount of albedo the landscape has, as well as how much CO2 is in the air, not only because of plant activity through photosynthesis to reduce CO2, but also the weathering of rocks can either increase or decrease CO2 levels depending on the type of rocks being weathered or the type of rocks being deposited uh, because of the chemistry of the rocks. For example, limestone is a rock that's made of calcium carbonate, CaCO3. That is basically calcium oxide, Ca, capital O, with carbon dioxide, CO2. That merges together in warm water to produce calcite, which then precipitates out, and that locks away a lot of carbon dioxide over time. Now, the natural release of gases from things like volcanic eruptions, the weathering of rocks, the, uh, as well as the release of aerosols from volcanic eruptions, aerosols are very fine-grained particles uh, that, or chemicals that can get up into the upper atmosphere and have interactions themselves can change the climate. For example, um, sulfur dioxide is one of the three most common gases that are released by a volcanic eruption. And if you get a large amount of sulfur dioxide up into the upper atmosphere, it can form a haze, which then creates a upper level albedo change, causing the albedo of the earth to increase, decreasing solar input, which can cause the earth to cool. We saw this with Pinatubo in 1991 when it erupted and for basically the next year the earth's climate was about one degree cooler than it had been in the previous year and then again the weathering and deposition of certain rocks can release or trap carbon dioxide um, now there's something else in here that we need to really talk about that is not talked about enough um, outside of certain climate circles and certain geologic circles which is something that could be very concerning for us in the near future, and that is the 10,000 year stability period. Um, we're not sure why this has happened. We do not know what mechanism it's been by. We've known since the mid to early 80s that the last 10,000 years of Earth history have been unusually stable in terms of the climate when it comes to the number and severity of storms worldwide. 
we base this based on the proxy of dust in the ice core because what we've noticed is that the amount of dust in the ice core for any given year is directly related to how many and how powerful were storms worldwide, especially storms like hurricanes and tornadoes, the severe and violent storm systems. Um, what we know is that prior to about 10,000 years ago, the amount of variability that took place in these climate systems was as much as 20 times greater than anything we've seen in the entirety of human written history, which is only about 4,000 years. There were indications in the 80s that this stability period may be ending. We don't know what caused it. We don't know what's going to end it. If it ends and we start seeing a greater swing in severity and no number of storms worldwide, this in, uh, in and of itself will mean that we will see greater degrees of powerful storms and greater degrees of flooding, tornadoes, damages that come with those powerful storms. But on the flip side, greater droughts as well. So that's something that we don't know why it happened. We know it's happened. It could be very well. Mother Nature is about to say, okay, training wheels are off. You've learned to ride. Let's see how well you can do it. Now, there's also things, the thing of car, uh, climate feedback, as well as the carbon budget. In a system, feedback is the process that either amplify or reduce the trends in the system. So a positive feedback will amplify the trend, a negative feedback will dampen the trend. Positive and negative feedbacks can lead to a self-regulating system. Remember when we talked about it in chapter one briefly where a system can be stable as long as it stays within a certain range. Um, some of the things that can feed back in these systems are like ice and albedo. Ice being brilliantly white, especially fresh ice, reflects a lot of sunlight back out. So ice cover can actually amplify the cooling effect. Um, and so it increases the albedo of the land, increasing the cooling effect. Same thing with aerosols that get put up into the air. They can increase the albedo and do the same. Um, there are many feedbacks, in fact, that involve the carbon budget and the carbon cycle. Take a look at pages 258 and 259. Um, this will show you part of the budget for, the, for carbon uh, or part of the carbon cycle. Unfortunately, it doesn't deal with the deposition of rock material or plant material, which eventually becomes coal or peat. Um, and it doesn't deal with the weathering of rocks. So that part is left out in your book, but it's still very helpful to see. You can see that the areas where carbon is being absorbed in the system are what we call carbon sinks. So trees are a good carbon sink. The ocean is a carbon sink. Um, the fortunate thing in some way is that humans have been tapping these carbon sinks to release energy. So carbon sinks also include things like coal, natural gas, oil, and we're, we've been using that for energy. We're using more of that than ever before, especially in developing countries. As developing countries develop and begin to move through the, the stages of industrialization and um, manufacturing, they tend to move through periods that were very similar to what we had, where pollution controls were just pretty much non-existent and a lot of pollution takes place. Um, we see the oceans are absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide right now. They're trying to absorb as much of the excess as they can. Some of this is going into the plankton, uh, especially the photosynthetic planktons that live in the ocean, um, but they can only handle so much. And what happens is the ocean water is actually acidifying, which is a natural consequence of carbon dioxide levels because when you mix carbon dioxide and water, as I mentioned, in fact, just last night, uh, that creates an, a weak acid called carbonic acid. And that can have consequences for some of the oceanic life. Um, what we will probably see in this is we'll see a decline in plants and animals that use calcium carbonate or calcite for their skeletal structures. And we'll see an increase in plants and animals that use silica for their structural systems.
Now, one thing to keep in note is that the Earth itself is actually getting greener. Um, this is happening because the greater degree of carbon dioxide in the air means there's more food for plants. Photosynthesis is a process where plants take carbon dioxide with water and use the energy of the sun to merge those two together to form sugars. So, and with a byproduct of oxygen. So, the more carbon dioxide available, the more food there is for the plants. The more the plants will grow, the more they will produce. In fact, in modern greenhouse situations, uh, especially agricultural production greenhouses where they grow things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, etc., they actually increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the greenhouse by th to the point where it's three to four times more than what it occurs in the environment naturally so that they get the maximum amount of production out of the plants. Now, what are some of the evidences that we have that change is happening right now? Well, we see that in general, temperatures are m rising, at least in terms of the temperatures we take over a period of time from the same stations over and over and over again. Um, we see some degree of ice melt where glaciers are retreating, especially over the last 40 years. Um, the amount of sea ice has dropped. Uh, glaciers have definitely pulled back from where they have been over the last couple of hundred years where we have records for those. Unfortunately, with sea ice, we only have about a 40-year record with sea ice, so we don't really know what sea ice was like more than 40 years ago. We've got some, some uh, loose talks about it, but we don't have any concrete evidence. So sea ice is one of those things where it's kind of an iffy subject to talk about too much if you try to go back beyond that 40-year trend. Um, what, you know, when we deal with flooding and weather, we'll talk about something that we call the 1% flood or sometimes referred to as the 100% or the 100-year flood. But in order to know what that is, we need 900 years worth of data. So 40 years of data in the climate, it's kind of a small data set and, and leads to some, some problems with it. As I said, glacial ice is retreating. Glaciers have in general been retreating and melting. Um, as well as permafrost. Permafrost is the condition where water in the ground is frozen beneath the surface of the ground. And we've seen areas, especially in Siberia and in Alaska and Canada, where some of those areas have been defrosting or melting. Now, this brings us to sea level rise. Um, mean sea level is variable. We have to keep that in mind. It really depends on where we're taking those measurements. For example, sea level is higher by about six inches on the eastern side of continents than it is on the western side of continents. And this has to do with the way ocean currents circulate. So there's already a problem. Um, as Besides the ocean current effects, Sea level is variable because of waves. The ocean is not a still body of water. It's in motion in many different ways. We have the tides. Those are variables in the sea level. Air pressure can actually have a minor effect on sea level, uh, especially air pressure differences which drive winds because wind can pile seawater up and move it around. Um, air temperature can have some degree of an effect. Water temperature can have some degree of effect. Wind patterns. Even gravitational variations, including gravi gravitational variations between the Earth, as well as the location of the moon relative to where you're measuring the sea level. Um, all of this can have an effect. And so in the long term, um, what we look, have looked at is basically uh, the position and distribution of continents can have an effect as well as the rate of spreading in plate tectonics. There are periods in Earth's history where we have seen ocean levels rise dramatically and those are related directly to periods of time where plate tectonics was much more active and the plates were moving around much faster. In fact, recent uh, a recent study came out about, what, two, two months ago or so, actually indicated that there may be a increase in velocity of plate tectonics that's taking place right now. So we may be seeing this natural cycle coming into play as well. Now, from records that were taken uh, on site on the ground, from 1901 to 2010, 
the average change in mean sea level was an increase of about 1.7 millimeters, about that big, a year, about the size of a, a typical sand grain. Um, satellite data, on the other hand, said that between 1983 and 2013, that it was 3.6 millimeters, an increase of year. Um, that doesn't agree, unfortunately, with what they were seeing in the site data. So that kind of brings some of the satellite data into question um, about which is more accurate, which is more realistic of a measure. Um, especially since satellites are moving and depending on how they're moving in, in orbit, their orbits change, depending on how you're using those for measuring systems, that might cause some of the problems. Um, atmospheric water vapor and extreme events are something that people want to talk about a lot right now. This only goes back to about 1973, so again, it's a very short period record for something that we really want to try to extrapolate to a longer term end. Um, but since 1973, global average specific humidity is up by about 0.1 grams of water pr vapor pressure per kilogram of air per decade. So since 1973, this being 2016, that's going to be a change of about 0.4 grams of water per kilogram of air over the period of time. What the trend was before 1973, we don't really know. Um, from 2001 to 2010, there was an increase in extreme events, basically an increase in storms, an increase in droughts um, in comparison to the recent history. But again, going back to what I said about the stability period um, that we've been in, if you go back beyond 10,000 years ago, what we've seen still doesn't match what was normal for the Earth prior to 10,000 years ago, as far back as 8 million years ago. So that amount of history still hasn't been qualified yet. And so how much of that extreme weather condition is due to climate change and how much of it is due to this other factor that we're still not 100% certain about um, remains to be seen. Now, what's causing present-day climate change? Well, the biggest culprit right now is greenhouse gases. We do see the amount of carbon dioxide and methane, as well as nitrous oxide and halogenated gases increasing in the atmosphere. Even water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Um, basically, they effectively trap heat in the atmosphere by slowing down how fast the heat can leave through diffuse scattering. So as the heat energy from the Earth's surface is trying to go up, it hits a particle, gets absorbed by the particle. That particle can then re-release uh, re that energy in any direction, 360 degrees by 360 degrees by 360 degrees. So it has just as much of a chance to shoot that heat energy back down towards the Earth as it does to shoot it back into outer space. Um, whatever gets shot back down is trapped heat, and therefore it heats up the atmosphere even more by diffuse scattering. Now, you'll see in your book um, on one of the pages there is a bit on forecast models, and they show where today is, and they show where models are predicting. Note the variability in the models. This is because, as I said at the beginning, the climate is a complex system. Models are a simplification of this complex system. In may, many cases, they may be an oversimplification. Um, this does not mean they're right. This does not mean they are wrong. Models are really not meant to say what is going to happen. They're more meant to tell us what may happen, what really is in the realm of possibility, what is not in the realm of possibility, based on the way we factor things. Um, so at best, really, all they can do is give us a sense of what can happen instead of what will happen. And we see this because one of the things that is a problem with the models is that you can give the models the current data and try to run it backwards, and they can't match what we know has happened. And that's an indicator that the models just are a little too simplistic and aren't able to account for everything. So for the ending on this, what can we do? What should we do? That's a great question, and that's a question that we really do need to debate. Um, some people push the idea of a carbon tax or carbon credits. 
Um, realistically speaking, some people have done the math on that. And if everything that's done along those lines, especially as pointed out in the Kyoto and Stockholm treaties on climate change were done worldwide, we would spend as the world about a trillion dollars a year, that's a trillion with a T, dollars a year on fighting climate change for a century. So we'd spend $100 trillion at minimum and we'd prevent 0.2 degrees of the 2.2 to 2.4 degrees of expected change. In other words, we have no real impact. Let that, mean, let that sink in. We can spend that much money and have no real impact. Um, that means that there are better ways to spend the money. What if we take that money and instead of spending on, say, taxing people to do climate change or to try to do carbon tax credits and whatnot, how about we do things like, oh, I don't know, protect the rainforest, buy up the rainforest, put it into private reserves, so that it, they aren't cut down, or use that money to help air and uh, help um, developing countries skip some of the more polluting steps that we have gone through in their energy um, demands and manufacturing capabilities. Uh, why don't we look at simple rules like, you know what, if you're going to take water out of the river, use it and put it back into the river, your intake has to be downstream of your output. Real simple. If what you're putting into the water goes into the water before you take it out, you're going to want to be cleaner. Um, we can also try to learn better to work with nature, not trying to force nature into our terms, or not trying to force man into nature's terms. There's a balancing act, and we have to find that balance. So, as well as the use of alternative energies. Anytime we can use alternative energies, especially clean energy, that's great. Problems are some people don't like it for various different reasons. Solar power is great, but if you look into it, solar cells, the production of them, create some really nasty pollution that has to be dealt with. Plus, solar power is only there when the sun is shining. So, unless you have battery systems that can work long term, store great amounts of energy, with low loss, it's, it helps during the day, but not, doesn't help at night. Nuclear energy is a viable option. You know, if you look at the average American's lifespan of 80 years, the amount of nuclear fuel needed to fuel that electrical need for 80 years is about six pounds. So, you know, versus several, about what is it? I think it's like 300 metric tons of coal big difference so anyway that's uh, the lecture for chapter eight again nice and short please use the Moodle please take a look at the um, PowerPoint that I put up on the Moodle for this there is uh, that what PowerPoint was put up uh, put together by a friend of mine it doesn't have a lot of uh, words in it but it does show you some interesting things about the trends of the climate and some of the pollution over time uh, especially how the, the Earth's climate is trying to work against the climate change to some degree, how the Earth is attempting to be a self-regulating system. All right, uh, that does it for this. Um, please remember, you've got a test on Wednesday. Hopefully you're seeing this before the 20, 22nd, and it's a test on the 29th. I wish you luck on those. Please, if you have questions, use the discussion in the forums for this on the Moodle. Um, Good luck on this. Good luck on the test. I believe you guys can do good on the test. Don't let don't let yourself down. Don't, not about letting me down. Don't let yourself down. Go into the test with a good attitude. You'll do good. Believe it. With that, I'll sign off for now. Next one I'll do is going to be for Chapter 9 and then Chapter 10. And I'll be back on the 30th to go over the Chapter 14 on... Uh, chapter 14 lab on topography and uh, contour lines.